Hello, uh, welcome to Beyond the Filter. My name is Liz Ryerson, and I'm here talking with uh, Emily Short. Uh, Hello. Hey. So you are an interactive fiction creator, author, and also a professor in in the UK. Is that correct? Well, I, I'm no longer professing. Okay. I used to be a professor, but am now mostly freelancing and otherwise employed in the game industry. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. And you run an you run an interactive fiction meetup too in the in the UK. I do, yeah. So I live in Oxford, and I kind of alternate that meetup between meeting in Oxford, which is closer to home and easier for me, and then meeting in London, which is easier for lots of people to get to. So we kind of alternate between the months. Oh, cool. Okay. So, speci what specifically, just like basic summary, is interactive fiction? So this is a question that will start fights, um, but I think um, the, the way that I would define it is um, you can sort of bring under that umbrella things that are interactive text, interactive stories, whether those are uh, twine pieces or choice script pieces like those created by Choice of Games or apps like 80 Days. Um, or sort of old school Infocom style games like Zork and its descendants. Um, so there's a there's and a we, group we can of... we can sorry, get into ahead. what we can get into what all those things are in a, in a sure. second. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I would just say you know the the people who sort of initially started calling themselves the interactive fiction community come out of that sort of Infocom tradition, um, but we've kind of accumulated a lot of uh, other genres as well. So. So, so the Inco Infocom games, just I, I'm just gonna give basic. Sure. <laughs> they're they're like they were uh, text-based games in the '80s, like early mid '80s, right? Um, yep. That had, uh, you know, when putting <laughs> images on the screen was was difficult, and like that, they're known for like having particularly good writing, right? Like Zork and and some of those. Right, yeah. So, I mean, they're particularly, they're parser-based games, so you would actually type a command like, you know, get the lamp, go north, those sorts of things, and then they would describe back to you what had happened. Um, but fairly early on, Infocom and some of the other companies that did this, because it wasn't just Infocom, um, started to get interested in what kind of richer stories could we be telling besides just kind of wandering around and collecting treasures. And so you've got things like Infocom's mysteries, like Deadline, where you're investigating this kind of locked room murder mystery. Um, you've got Trinity, which is actually kind of a slightly fantasy story, but about um, the invention of the atom bomb. Um, so there are a bunch of different kinds of things going on, and they were doing lots of interesting experiments with kind of how to put standard story genres into a text-based computer game. So the, this is kind of like the... Um, <laughs> considered like the, the sort of cl classic maybe conception of what interactive fiction wa is, or maybe the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so uh, after... So, so Infocom sold many, many copies of many, many things during the course of the 80s and had a lot of sort of enthusiastic followers, and there were several other companies, Scott Adams, Level 9, Melbourne House, creating text adventures as well. And then they got to a point where competing with games with more graphics was really just not working anymore. There was not a sufficiently large audience to, to sell, and one by one those companies went away again. Um, usually, most of them made some attempt to make some kind of graphical text hybrid adventure first before going out of business, but they all did. Um, but uh, the kind of people who had really enjoyed those genres um, stuck around on the internet and uh, sort of created forums on CompuServe and other places that, that you could kind of meet other like-minded people in the early 90s. Um, and then eventually a Usenet group um, called rec.arts.infiction, which drew in a lot of people who are basically kind of hobbyists remembering the old games and creating new ones in the same style. Cool. Yeah, I I actually discovered it, it's interesting cuz um you know, uh I I sort of more know and have followed the progression of quote unquote indie games and all that stuff and it, it is interesting, I mean, especially for people who might not be kind of 
into this stuff i i i think the thing that that i find interesting about interactive fiction in the community specifically is there isn't a lot of overlap actually into the quote-unquote games realm a lot of times um or it seems like its own kind of distinct community rather yeah it is i mean it's <laughs> it depending on how you want to frame this it's either a very robust long running community with a lot of its own sort of traditions and craft and and lots of positive things or it's you know sort of incredibly closed off to any kind of modern advance um so <laughs> so depending on how you want to look at that but um you know the i became aware of and involved with interactive fiction in the late 90s, um, which is an incredibly long time ago um, now, uh, but um, a lot of the people that I met then who were interested in it then are still around. Not all of them by any means, but but there is quite a lot of real continuity in the form of, yeah, people have been doing this for two and a half decades and they're still at it. Yeah, the, the the one community that I have experience like with that kind of stuff in, or at least following, was like do, Doom modding, um, and like <laughs> that community has also been around since like the game Doom came out. And there are some people. I mean, it hasn't retained as much, but there are some people that are like have you know at least been there since the late '90s. So it's kind of interesting how these communities like preserve themselves after years and years and years. Um, but so so I guess more recently with interactive fiction there's been it feels like there's been more more splinters off of it like you mentioned Twine which was like uh, this uh, program that's um, more a little bit more user friendly and the interface instead of you type in commands and there's a text parser that you know picks that you know you, you type in different a different sort of set of commands that like is there is there at all like established rules about like you know what commands work and and what or, or is it different different programs or different whatever use different commands that are sort of the defaults that that you can use or is it completely dependent on the 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 actual piece of work or the author um so Okay, so there are conventions um, in the interactive fiction community, and those conventions are strongly supported by the fact that there are sort of two or three languages um, and and supporting libraries that have been used to write a lot of the hobbyist parser IF of the last couple decades. So Inform, Tads, Hugo, Adrift, Allen, um, those are kind of the main things that people use to create new um, interactive fiction quest, also I should mention. Um, and so there's sort of a standard set of verbs like, you know, taking things and dropping things, opening things, unlocking things. I, you know, there's, there's quite a list, but it's a kind of a standard set of verbs that almost all of those systems um, uniformly provide a default implementation of. So as an author, you will automatically have those verbs in your game unless you actually go out of your way to remove them again, which is possible. Okay. Um, but so as an author, typically what happens is you know, sort of out of the box, you have this standard set of verbs, and then if you want to add some additional things because you've got some extra mechanics in your game, you can. Um, or if you've decided that actually your game would be more fun if it just had a small set of verbs, you can strip out a lot of the library-provided ones. And there's actually been kind of a trend towards that in the last few years of what people call limited parser games, where they do still take typed input, but... Um, it's intentionally a much more restricted set of things that you're allowed to type, and the idea is that in those games they're going to tell you exactly what all of the possible commands are, so the kind of doubt and confusion that people sometimes have confronting a parser game of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to type here, well, you've got a complete list of possible verbs, so we're just like going to constrain um, what the experience is in order to make it a bit easier. That's It's interesting because like, I think that echoes the sort of... Um a lot of design uh, kind of a dogma or whatever design I, I won't even say dogma but tr trends of like if you talk about like the 80s and early 90s it point and click adventure games where you kind of just I guess the the idea was they were just trying to make like an experience that you really spent a lot of time in because maybe you only bought one game 
or you didn't ha you didn't own that many games, so it, more people were patient about banging their head against the wall. Uh, so there were more like um, you know puzzles or things like that that are just like strange and unintuitive. And, oh yeah. Um, but now I, the trend is definitely towards more streamlined experiences and uh, you know more more linear stuff. And um, I don't know. I definitely see that with like. I mean, like, like I was mentioning with Twine, uh, as a as a a program that's like it doesn't it's not parser based. Uh, you click on you know you interact with the text. You click on it sort of like a little bit like HyperCard, which was a program for Mac uh, back in the eighties and nineties. Um, that takes me back. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like HyperCard is better than Twine to be honest. But uh, um, I, I never, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy Twine, but it, it is very limited. Um, unless you want to kind of, it. I enjoy Twine because it's accessible. But like once you want to get past a certain point, you actually have to do a lot more. It's kind of like this weird combination of very accessible and then not accessible but anyway you kind of just have to copy scripts and like you have to know like css and stuff uh anyway um but but the, that kind of, those kind of games became a lot more popular a lot more recently like just in the past four years or whatever and um has that uh well and i also noticed like uh, a lot more graphical you know, quote unquote indie games like 80 Days, like you mentioned, that um, use a lot of interactive fiction ideas um, towards, you know, a, a more, you know, like a graphical game experience. Um, so it seems like a lot of stuff has, um, a lot of interactive fiction influence has permeated into other things. Um, but has that stuff sort of, uh, permeated back into the interactive fiction community. Like I, I want. Like I know that there was a, there was, you know, there was initially some kind of uh, tension between people who made Twine-based stuff and you know people who made Parser-based stuff. Is that more? Are those things more intersected now, or are they still kind of divided up into different? Ah, uh, <laughs> so the, okay. I mean. Yes, there is. Uh, I mean, I I would say there's there's things that come together more, but there's still a certain amount of friction there. Um, so one example of this is that the the IF competition, which is a, a yearly competition that's been running every fall for over twenty years now, um, it used to be even certainly ten years ago possibly even sort of five or six years ago, that if you submitted a game to that competition that was not a parser-based game, if it was a choose-your-own-adventure of some kind or hypertext or twine, um, people would react to that by by just considering that a total category error to even submit it there. Like, they, you would get a bad score, and the reviews would say things like, you know, this might be interesting, but it's not interactive fiction the way not that we define it. Not a game. This is not well, a yeah, game. Well, yeah, I mean, it is, it is exactly that. It is exactly that thing. That, this is, which is why I, why I dislike having to define what IF is or what a game is, because okay. so often being asked to define that is like, it's part of an argument about where resources go and where community boundaries are drawn rather than an actual, like, let's thoughtfully sit back and without any kind of, you know, bias, just think about, um, you know, what the formal boundaries of these things are. It's never, it's never just about that. It's always about, like, who gets heard and who doesn't get heard and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a kind of stressful conversation to have in some ways. Um, but uh, so we're now at a point where um, people are submitting quite a lot of material to the interactive fiction competition, which is not parser-based. Um, some of it's in Twine, some of it's in other systems. The game that actually won this year for the first time is not a parser-based game. Oh, um, wow. So somebody submitted a game that does have... It has a world model, so there's an underlying knowledge. It's not a Twine game. It's a game that, that does have an underlying structure um, knowing about locations and inventory items, and you can wander around and get things, but it is rendering all of that with um, choices that you can click rather than uh, rather than making you type things. And I think it is probably more accessible for people to get into. If they're not familiar with how parser games work, they would be able to play this game and find that 
um, a little bit more uh, accessible, I guess. Um, and you also get uh, illustrations and some other nice things coming with that. Um, so in that sense, things have opened up a bit, but there's still a certain amount of, I think, tension between, on the one hand, some people feel like games that are parser-based in some parts of the community still get kind of a leg up um, because some of the community is still sort of bringing with the, you know, that sort of sense of like, well, this other stuff is okay, but what That's I really like is, you know, the real thing is this. And then also, all, you know, sort of layered on top of that, all of the kind of stuff that, like some of the same things that go behind the this is not a game discussion, like, you know, people, some people are more inclined to respect something if they can see that serious coding work must have gone into it right yeah. like somehow that's like more respectable right than, that, and, and and i find that very frustrating because some of the pieces that are choice based clearly are demonstrating quite a lot of craft and care potentially of a different kind like some of them are, you know there's some really beautifully written things some things that are very poetic i'm like a lot of still went into that too it's not yeah. like you've got to you know so that's yeah a... it's I mean, that's the thing that that has been a problem for almost every different sort of sub online sub creative community that I've been in where people value some kind of technical skill or wizardry above everything else. Like, you know, when I, in music communities, it's like people who were really good at performance, like people who are really good at like playing guitar or whatever, you know, or, or playing an instrument where, you know, we're we're kind of a lot more popular sometimes than yeah. than other things and you know in in things like uh modding communities it was stuff that had a lot of changes for a while it was stuff that had a lot of changes to like the game like a lot of changes to the source code or whatever and like you know added a bunch of extra features and had a, like a bunch of levels like you couldn't just make a small amount of levels you had to make a lot and it had to be all super <laughs> ambitious yeah and and like other projects that were smaller were fine but like the ones that people really care about and talk about it's the same thing with like i still follow that doom stuff and you know the ones that people like talk about and you know are like really care about are, are like the the full replacements of 32 levels of doom which is like if one, <laughs> if one person is trying to design 32 levels it's it's kind of absurd it's 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 a extreme amount of work to do and oftentimes there's just a lot of repetition and and stuff just to fill that out because that's the format that is like favored by the community and if you want to get sort of attention or respect in that community you kind of have to you still have to follow that to some extent. Um, <laughs> although maybe it's changing a little bit, but like it is interesting. Cause I think about the dynamics of like, I mean, this is something that I like talked with a lot of different people about on the, on this podcast is like, um, I feel like you, like a, a lot of these communities, you have a lot of very smart people uh, investing a lot of energy and resources into defining the boundaries of of what that community is and trying to kind of uh, uh keep it very tight you know like um and i don't know i guess that's the 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 frustrating thing to me is i feel like my ideal situation is that people make the kinds of works that they want to make and the decisions that you make about what you put in your game or what you put in your your you know your interactive fiction novel is that or what what is the word that people uh <laughs> well i mean some yeah it depends what kind of thing it is i mean some people say game some people say work some people say story it okay yeah okay interactive fiction work um my my ideal with that or or not just that but like that stuff is that people would make decisions about what kind of thing that they put in it completely based on what the individual work is so like you know if it's a kind of game that um the a parser interface would make more sense or it would kind of have something to do with the narrative then then they do that but if it's something where you know like i just don't like the idea that people are doing things in a format that doesn't really work just because it's expected that you do things in that format in order to get taken seriously or get recognition or whatever. And um, it seems like things might be moving more towards the direction of people making the decision 
you know, uh, based on what the individual work is. But I guess that's my like ideal situation for a lot of that stuff. But and yet, you know, things yeah. are, are often very much not that way. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think we certainly have moved substantially in that direction, um, even though there are still people who wish that there were more support for specific kinds of things or who are frustrated by, you know, inevitably, like every year during the competition, there are some reviewers who will start reviews by saying, like, this is not the kind of IF that I personally like, blah, 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 blah. And I know that that's frustrating for the people who are on the receiving end of those preferences. Um, <laughs> I get I get the I get but, those comments a lot about like um, things that I make. I feel yeah, like. yeah. Well, sure. Um, but I think it. I, I nonetheless, like I think it is a lot better in that you know you're not like things get brought in and they're not necessarily automatically dismissed and and some things you know that it's kind of widened the window of what gets submitted at all. So this year, for instance, um, there was a, ga a well game is completely the wrong word actually. There was a piece submitted. Um, called Fallen Leaves, which was a piece of procedural poetry that was recombining elements from a corpus based on a bunch of Confucian um, poetry samples. And, like, it's just the kind of thing where it's a, it's a really interesting art piece. I, it doesn't, like, I, I didn't feel like it completely clicked for me, but it was really interesting to have it in there, and it was completely different from what you know a few years ago like people would just not have seen that as the kind of thing that you would submit to the IF comp at all um but i think it like now it feels a little bit more natural to have that kind of thing in there because in addition to kind of spreading to include twine and those kinds of things there's been recently a lot more interest in um you know procedural narrative and procedural text in uh, just kind of other things around the borders of what IF has traditionally been, which I personally like a lot because I feel like there's a ton that we can be learning from sort of adjacent disciplines, both technically and aesthetically. Um, so I'm glad when I see that happening, even when things are not necessarily, like, you know, not every experiment, especially if it's trying to cross over between media not every experiment is a rousing success, but that, like, nonetheless, like, that can have a huge value. And to my mind, sometimes it's more valuable than something that is a perfectly crafted but unambitious example of the same kind of thing that people have been making for 20 years. Like, there's nothing wrong with the latter, but it's not necessarily advancing things particularly either. Yeah, I, I guess, like... My uh, when I see stuff like that, what I what, what I look for in terms of like if I'm trying to follow a new community or something is how diverse are the things that are in it, um, mm -hmm. and if it, it like are people open to something that is unexpected, um, and I feel like I don't know I there's a lot of like especially because of. Uh, you know the uh, the election and everything else like the US election and and also like Brexit and things like that um <laughs> there's um i feel like there's a lot of talk about how the internet um and social media is like super er, divided and parsed out now into different bubbles and i think that's definitely true but also i feel like you see in a lot in some of these communities like um or at least from what it sounds like this and and you know i still follow like i said i still follow the doom community like um i feel like some of those communities have actually been opening up and like branching mm -hmm. out and and making changes that are kind of um like opening them, themselves up in order to kind of survive and maintain you know what was interesting about them and i i i find that to be like a tremendously like optimistic and good sign cuz like you know, a lot of those sub communities, uh, a lot of sub communities have died because they had that one thing that they ran into the ground and then <laughs> people got bored. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I was talking to um, uh, Nat Natalie Lawhead, who made this uh, compilation of games called Tetragedon Games. Yep. Um, and she was talking about like the Flash Flash development community and you know the, the kind of projects people made in Flash. And she was saying that you know there was a lot of interesting stuff, but it got a bad connotation because I th people were trying to um, 
one up each other, I guess, and um, do more technically complicated, you know, more and more kind of complicated things. And eventually people got tired of it and people got bored of it. And I, I guess maybe it just got overexposed and it kind of started to die out after a while. Like, um, and, and I, I guess, I guess that's also the thing where, you know, once people see that a, a certain community gets popular enough, it might not be like mainstream popular, but, <laughs> um, I often feel like people come into the community and they want, you know, they want to do the next big thing. They want to be the next big person in that community. So, um, it's, it's more and more people trying to kind of, um, make things very much towards what that community likes and wants instead of kind of trying to make whatever they're personally, um, you know, really feel passionate about or into and oh, it becomes, definitely, yeah. It, yeah. And it almost becomes more and more like a social game or, you know, people kind of just trying to impress other people. And I think that tends to kill a lot of communities or make them very, very, very narrow after a certain point um but it seems like you know some of those communities that are still around are totally opening up more and you know interactive fiction is a pretty broad category or could potentially be a pretty broad category of different things which i think makes it you know you can you could put it in a lot of different places and contexts which you know makes it have a lot more longevity than maybe a lot of other things yeah, definitely. I mean, there are, there are groups that are doing what I would consider interactive fiction who are completely disconnected from the like what I would consider the main IF community. You know, there are people out there who are doing Twine but who aren't submitting their Twine pieces to uh, the IF database. There are people who are um, using interactive fiction in educational contexts that aren't really connected up with the rest of the group. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that right like it, it actually means that the media is robust enough that it can support lots of different applications and it's not only thriving on being this one thing with this one set of people associated with it um i would say like there there are a couple of things about sort of the current diversity like there are a couple of things that i think have been lost or are in danger of being lost even though like I really like what is happening in the sense of of that kind of openness but there are a couple of things that I'm concerned about um, that we used to be really good about and that we're not doing as well now um, so one of them is just or like we talk a lot about accessibility but um, like it used to be because so much of parser IF is just purely text-based and does not have any kind of CSS aspect or anything like that um, the major it used to be that the majority of interactive fiction that was written was compatible with the screen reader, um, and so there were it was one of the kinds of games that was very accessible to people with some kind of visual impairment. Um, oh. And so, like those communities used to really like playing IF, and now not as much of what is put out is screen reader compatible, um, and that's really unfortunate. I think I mean like, it's like a case where. Yes, okay, now we've gotten to a place where <clears throat> some of these games are easier for people, like, the, for the average person to get at. Um, but on the other hand, there was, there was a group of people that were getting something out of this that now are having a harder time accessing it, and that's quite unfortunate. So there's been a little bit of work around sort of how do we improve, especially Twine's screen reading um, but other things as well, just trying to figure out, like, can we, what are, what are some good standards, how can we address this and sort of fix that, because otherwise we're in danger of just kind of, like, ce ceasing to support that group of people in any meaningful way, which would be bad. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, not, it, it, like, a less of a personal thing um, is that historically the IF community was really good about uh, archiving and preservation, because games, like most of the games that were being created were in one of a handful of formats, and um, the standard way to publish your game for a couple of decades was to put it on the Interactive Fiction Archive and then announce that you had done that and people would download it from there. So for a long time, like almost everything that was produced by the IF community was put on the IF Archive and indexed in a way where you could come back and find it 
later. And now, a lot of things that are being produced, people are putting up and hosting on their own, own websites or at random other places, which is fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But that means that some of those pieces go away again. And it's actually harder to reconstruct some of the things from the last five years than it is to reconstruct, like, what was going on in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, those, there are just, like, specific things where you know, in general, having a more diverse ecosystem is wonderful, and having sort of more technical variety is wonderful, but there were certain specific advantages that we got out of, like, okay, basically everything is made the same way, and that means that we can present it consistently, and we can archive it consistently, mm-hmm. um, and that was easy to do. So, like, trying to figure out how to make up for that is kind of important. Yeah. Well, and that's a, a thing of, like, it's a matter of how big the community is and how much resources it's invested in that, because, like, the IF community seems fairly large um, compared to a lot of other communities. Because, like, uh, com- communities that I've been in that have been smaller, um, you know, or more kind of anarchic or whatever, it might have some of the sense of creativity and uh, just experimentation. Um, oftentimes, a lot of those things disappear um, because there isn't anyone you know there isn't enough of a consistent effort to archive everything and make it you know especially with like i think about this with with indie games there was a um there was a there there was that uh like paper zine kind of thing going around at gdc for <laughs> yeah. Amaze, Amaze Fest, and there was an article in there about how someone someone who used to review indie games you know and from like i don't know like 2006, 2007 to 2011, 2012 and like how a lot of those games uh, like a lot of them have disappeared and these are things released in the past 10 years you know and it seems to be the <laughs> the, the, the problem of like it, things being so accessible is like uh, especially things made before people were really conscious of that or before like it, 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 you know it's harder to make some of those things compatible um, a lot of those works kind of disappear, and um, it's really sad because I feel like I don't know. It's it's always frustrating with me, for me because I'm like you know I'll uh, um, um I think there's a lot of interest in you know, and I I actually probably am gonna uh, have some money on the show to talk about this, but, uh, there's a lot of interest in preserving, I feel like, um, like Nintendo games that didn't ever get released or things like that. Um, but there's not as much interest in preserving people's kind of weird experiments that they put online and kind of, I, I, I just wish there was more kind of resources and energy, directed towards um it 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 feels like it's very up to the communities to kind of decide if these things are worth preserving and how to preserve them and if you know they're not big enough communities or there isn't somebody doing that then um they're kind of on their own and there isn't like a lot of interest for a lot of people who are um outside of you know maybe a small group but for a lot of people who are you know historians or preservationists or whatever um there's often not a lot of interest in these kind of smaller, more niche stuff, like more experimental stuff. Um, and I f- oftentimes feel like that's w- s- where the most interesting ideas lie, even if they're mm. not always well executed, you know? Um, and yeah, I don't for know. the IF community, it's the thing is that we do actually have this infrastructure in place. Like, there is an archive. There are people who support that archive. There are multiple mirrors set up for it. Like, all of the, uh, you know, that, that kind of work of, like, where should we put this and how does it work is there, and there are people who maintain it. But the trick is that, like, that doesn't mean that everybody who uses Twine knows that the archive is a place where they could put their thing to preserve it, right? Yeah. So. Um, and it's not like there there have been a few people who've tr- sort of tried to go around and find out as many things as possible that have been released and like let people know oh hey like would you like to archive this um, but that's I mean it's kind of this intensive ongoing thing to try and track down what all is being made yeah. um, it's basically like it's up to individual like you don't 
you don't want to just go and grab something and put it on the archive without the author's permission. Like you could hypothetically yeah. capture their HTML file, but they might not want that. So you know, yeah. obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, preservation is such a, a huge thing in this day and age, especially especially for things that are, um, you know, made quickly digitally and made attached to specific programs or things uh, or plugins or things that might change and you know might not be might not work over time like in that article that I was mentioning in that Amaze Fest um, newspaper thing that there were also a lot of like um, a lot of those games stopped working not because the website disappeared or whatever but just because the version of like Unity web player or something changed and it made those games not work anymore. And uh, yeah. <laughs> the author hasn't what isn't around to sort of change it and make it compatible. So that and that's yeah. the most frustrating thing cuz like that's the thing that you have the least control over. Well, that's even a thing. I mean, even if the author is still around, there is a couple of my things actually that I made for basically for platforms that were kind of new or experimental and then those became non-working again and I don't necessarily have a way to fix them or I could maybe fix them but only with a tremendous amount of effort which like if it's a choice between do I recreate an old previous work of mine or do I instead make something new I'm probably going to make a new thing instead um, so yeah I don't know. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. tricky problem in general yeah I yeah. I have, a, I have a few things that are kind of like that too. That there's some music projects. I have a lot of my old stuff, so I'm happy about that. But there's there's some there's like one or a few music projects that I can't. I use like an old program for, and I could probably try and find a ver. I think I even tried to find a version of that program, but it wouldn't open these files. Like it, I, either they were corrupted or they it probably just didn't support that version or something, you know. And it wasn't like a program that you know enough people had invested trying to s support things and make them backwards compatible and I don't know it's it's frustrating um, just because like I don't know I feel like especially when we're talking about companies that are making these programs and they're profitable in some way or <laughs> you know they're they're yeah. disconnected from a specific community um, then um <laughs> There's a there's less incentive for them to support that stuff or even be fully aware of it, um, and more incentive to just <laughs> follow the market and like trash a lot of stuff. And you know, it, it's it's wonderful that people have gone to the effort to preserve all the stuff that they have, um, but it, it is like I feel like especially when things are newer. Like I know this is true also with like like. Do modding where um, stuff that came out in the um, first couple years of the community being active, like when there wasn't really anything in place quite yet to like you know um, preserve stuff. Um, a lot of that stuff just doesn't, you know, even though there's tons of that stuff around, like people are still finding that stuff and, and uploading it now like all the time but a lot of that stuff s just doesn't exist anymore um yeah and and maybe we're in one of those times where you know twine is relatively new and people are kind of just uploading it and not really thinking about it and like it hasn't been around long enough for a lot of some of those people that really you know who are just kind of getting in and experimenting to really have a consciousness that that stuff is is going on yeah, or they just put, I mean, you know, it's not even necessarily that they have no consciousness around it, it's just that they, they don't necessarily, like, like sometimes people put things up on itch or something, right? And that's, it's not like that's a bad place yeah. to put it. Um, it's just that that's thinking, it's, it's not particularly thinking around interactive fiction archiving, it's thinking around, like, here's how we put things up in the, the indie space, and that's cool. Um, but it doesn't. It means that it's harder to kind of have a uniform, um, just just any kind of sort of coherent history of what we've been doing in IF and 
Yeah, um, it be- it becomes <laughs> a huge task for people to pick that stuff apart and and decide, you know, w- and kind of d- define the history and what is what is worth kind of talking about. I I guess that's one thing that like I feel like is, you know, that's uh, more and more people um probably are and and should be investing kind of resources into defining an alternate history for for some of these things that is kind of conscious not just you know for for video games also just for digital media in general things that kind of exist outside of traditional forms of art um i i think it's like a huge and really important task for people to kind of especially for something like video games in particular because the history is so defined by like the the winners people <laughs> people who uh companies or whatever who sold lots of copies and uh, um but um i feel like it's it's especially become especially important this day and age for people to kind of come up with an alternate form of history and you know to highlight the works that that they think are important and kind of draw that through line in the way that they they can to to bring you know something else to light that might have been missed before yeah yeah that's <laughs> but that's itself a huge amount of work i mean i like i mean i totally agree that that's important to be doing um but i think one of the things that so so i've been having a lot of conversations with people recently about sort of what they wish the if community would be doing better actually i have these conversations all the time i always do um so that's it's not like just recently or something but um but one of the frustrations that I'm hearing from people right now is around feeling like sometimes these really ambitious and interesting works come out and then there's not a lot of deep conversation about them, like people really engaging with them extensively and talking about what works and doesn't work as a piece of craft. Um, so like there's a huge twine piece that came out in last year's IF Comp um, called Spy Intrigue. And there's a ton going on in it, both as a sort of literary work and in terms of its sort of technical features, because it's set up so that you actually can see a little teeny node map of kind of um, what the next uh, story nodes are that you could get to from where you are at the moment, um, which is kind of an interesting thing to to give somebody an idea of and it's making a really u- interesting use of all of the death scenes in the story and it's like there's a lot going on um mm-hmm. and it's really intriguing and it's the kind of thing where you know it deserves to have several like in-depth thoughtful articles written about its themes and about how it was designed and all this kind of stuff but the thing is because it came out during IF comp last year which was until this year the largest IF comp there'd ever been there were like 53 games released and people had six weeks to play them in and just like so the attention was just spread too thin like people did review this game but they didn't review it at anything like the depth that something that ambitious you know needs to be engaged at. I've lost the I've lost the grammar of that sentence but you know what I mean yeah uh, uh, there just wasn't like you know and, and I admit like my review of it was based on uh, two hours of playthrough, which was the amount of time that I had to give it, and that's the amount of time you're supposed to spend on a comp game, um, but really, like, to review it well, I should have played it multiple times, and I should have spent, you know, more time, like, really kind of digging into it, and it should but, it's like, well, I didn't have, you know, 12 to 20 hours to invest in doing that level of job on it while also covering the other 52 games in the competition. Um so, so yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely kind of a a challenge of, like, on, on the one hand, there's this breadth of, like, so much is going on in so many different places that just keeping track of all of it is hard. And then on top of that, that's there's this stuff that is really good and interesting requires this kind of deep dive engagement, which not ever, like, you know, just the number of people who have that kind of time to put into it for the community is not great enough to to cover what's being made, essentially. Um, yeah. It's, like, I mean, it's mostly super frustrating for authors. Like, you put a huge amount of time into making something which is really interesting and different and trying to do something that hasn't been done before and then to get, like, a, you know, minimal response or or to get people saying, hey, this was really cool, but that's all they say about it rather than, you know. 
Yeah, God, that's been one of my biggest problems with so many of these communities. Like, so, uh, like uh, following indie game stuff, um, it's kind of on the tail end of judging for IGF, and I'm doing that this year, and I'm just too stressed out about other things to really, <laughs> like, put a lot of time into it. But, like, uh, the Independent Games Festival is what I mean. Yeah. And, um, uh, and like there's like 600 some 700 i don't know how many games submitted there's like 750 um, last year i think so yeah it's about yeah. oh i should have i should actually check cuz i was yeah i was wondering if it was like going down or going um um cuz i w- i was trying to keep track of like how much it kind of fluctuated from year to year yeah uh there's 672 so there's actually less entries <laughs> this year that's interesting um well, because they had a student competition in a you know regular, co- and then they made they combined those last year. Um, but anyway, uh, the point is like there's way too much stuff, and like I, increasingly more and more, um, you know, when I I feel like when indie games started out, like oftentimes there was a few works that people really talked about, and um, you know, there are a lot of kind of smaller scale experiments. I don't even feel like this might have even been true. I think there were probably more ambitious things. But, like, especially these days in following indie games, like, for me, there's so much different kinds of stuff. There's a lot of a lot of people have really interesting ideas. There's works that are increasingly more complex and that take a kind of a sustained conversation to really break apart. And basically no one is having that conversation about like so many of these these games and like i i don't know i i had that frustration with the game that i made problematic like i mean i talked to you about that um and uh i got really like uh it was extremely depressing for me because i felt like um and and I even had people, uh, a couple people, come forward and write sort of more deeper pieces about it. But but that was it. Like it wasn't like a real conversation. It was just kind of like w- one or two people who really liked this thing were like, uh, okay, I'm gonna like actually write something about this. And like I guess my idea when I got into kind of more game design stuff was like, I'm gonna do something more kind of challenging and whatever. And that's the kind of those are the kinds of works that are really important and really valuable and kind of expand people's awareness of things and kind of bring you into new in, in interesting territories and like I feel like those are the kind of works that get the most like fucked over by <laughs> the way the way things are right now uh and and it it really favors kind of maybe some of the smaller scale works or like things that are you know at least for for indie games like i've noticed that kind of trend of like there's one or two interesting things about a game but you kind of can know you kind of like it's easy to kind of pick them apart within the first 20 minutes of playing something that you kind of know what's going to happen maybe there's like one twist or something and those are the kind of things that often get you know get the most attention is things that are kind of like look kind of polished and like um you know they they have one or two interesting things that is pretty apparent from the beginning so you know what you're getting into and that's great for people who are consumers who who want to find something that you know um that that matches with their their preferences but it's it's not good for for trying to make a challenging piece of art that you know challenges people's conceptions about things cuz you need a sustained engagement over a, a, a longer period of time and more people invested in talking and debating about these things and that's definitely not there right now and yeah that's like that's the reason why I don't make more stuff because I'm interested <laughs> in making that kind of stuff and I know that like knowing that like I'm going to put something out there and people will be like oh, okay this is kind of weird or this is cool and there might be one person who's like oh this is really awesome you know like knowing that that's going to happen it's it's kind of like you know if I, I don't know i i know like a lot of people who are like oh i just like making things for myself and that's great but for me like <laughs> right. uh, for for me I, i'm trying to make a like a start a conversation and when there's no conversation happening like what what do you what do you, what the hell are you supposed to do you know and yeah i don't know i but i think it's a really good point like i i'm i'm struggling with that a lot 
right now. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I'm not going to paint this as something where there was ever really a, a totally golden age because, you know, sort of not enough feedback is like the perennial cry forever. Like, everybody has always felt there was not enough feedback for what they created. But I would say, like, there was a point in the IF community in the late 90s when I joined where things were a lot more focused and what I mean by that is there weren't that many things being released and the major works that like the, the things that were sort of major canonical works were things that like basically everybody who was part of that community had played them um, and that meant that if you if people wanted to have a technical conversation about what was interesting about a new game those technical conversations often were grounded in this really developed shared vocabulary where people had a lot of ideas about how puzzles should be structured and about how settings should be represented and about how characters could be programmed and how they could work aesthetically and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so you would get these long threads where people were talking on these news Usenet groups about what was going on in these games um, in a way that felt it felt much like, like I mean, to, in, in one sense, it was really narrow because it tended to be very craft focused and not necessarily going all of all that deep into what was happening thematically in a work. Like sometimes people would talk about that, but mostly it was about what is going on in this piece in terms of technical design. But it would be a pretty sophisticated technical design discussion um, because most of the people who are participating in that group were both players and authors and were quite dedicated, had been there for a while, had been part of that, like, tiny little... It was as though we'd been in a college seminar together for years and, like, all picked up the same vocabulary and would talk about things. Um, and now, I feel like, even if I wanted to have that kind of conversation about a new piece, it's, it's hard, like, not that much of the IF community still works that way. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 not just about, like, are there one or two people who are reviewing serious... I mean, we do have, like... I mean, I try to review things in depth when I have time and when I think that they're interesting to take a deep dive into. Mm -hmm. And I, there are other people in the IF community who also, you know, there, there are long-form reviews that happen. It's just, like, not enough of them relative to what's being produced, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, I, I, I think so sometimes I get mad, like, I, I think this is... This is what spurred me to contact you about like my game is is sometimes I, I like I get mad sometimes when I'm reading this is not just centered around video games it's, it's music and other stuff too where I'm reading something that where like people are like oh if only you know there was this kind of art that you know did this like I haven't seen anything that's <laughs> done that and it's like yeah. there's probably something that's done that out there it's just people probably don't know about it you know like and and so like bringing those things it, like I feel like I don't want to like criticism writing criticism is hard and you know I know a lot of people who are maybe artists who are ambiv ambivalent to criticism but I think it's really important and um, it's important because it's important to like intersect things into each other and bring parts of different conversations into each other at least in my view um, and I feel like, um, where was I going with that? I, I, I feel like, um, I often, like, I often see people who are critics and stuff be like, oh, you know, I, I wish there was this kind of art or this kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, and it, it is like frustrating when, when it's been like, um, where you know that you have done things that would totally blow someone's mind but somehow either they're not open to it because you didn't write you know you didn't write it on this website or you didn't present <laughs> it in this way yeah or you know or they're just like it's it's in a form that they're not like you know they don't feel comfortable engaging with that much or you know like other things and it's like kind of like there's always a sense that you need to do more or something and yet it's really not that it's that like there just isn't things things aren't coming together in a way that like and i i don't know like when we were talking about communities diversifying and all that kind of stuff i feel like the way that the internet has gone has 
sort of become has trended towards doing that as far as um you know for these long-term communities and things opening up and everything and that's that's a great sign but it's also trended away from <laughs> from doing a deep dive into anything and i don't know like how you kind of create something that the the whole ecosystem of the internet is oriented away from trying to to do <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, you know, on a one-off basis, you you still can, but it's hard. Like, like I mean, the thing is, I feel like I'm never going to, I don't know, like, I feel like I, I, whenever this comes up, I'm like, I should put more time into this, but I, like, I'm already spending 100% of my time, yeah. <laughs> essentially, um, and uh and also, like a weird thing also happens um, when you do like like sometimes I will find a piece that like especially if I am covering something that's from outside the regular IF community, but even sometimes uh, internal to it, like I'll find something that I think is really interesting, and I'll write a long piece about it, um, and then the author of that piece will. Like they'll decide that I'm basically their new best friend because I've like paid them <laughs> paid them more attention than anybody else, and then they'll like send me a bunch of they'll be like, well maybe you, like do you want to write a follow up thing about this or like they'll just kind of like ask me to do a bunch more stuff around their work, which is flattering. Like I'm not that it's not like there's something wrong with them doing that, but I like I almost feel like like I'm accidentally set up an unreasonable set of expectations like my my initial paying attention to them was not <laughs> this I don't know like it was not a promise that I was going to be able to cover them forever and yeah and, and like I could see how that might be disappointing to them but I also have a bunch of other things in other corners that I need to go pay attention to, too. And so it becomes this sort of weird thing where people, I feel like I do this and then I continually am, like, letting those people down afterwards, which is kind of an unhappy thing to feel. Yeah, I just, I, I feel like in general with a lot of this stuff, there's a real lack of, like, uh, a bro sort of broader or more institutional support or things, like, that that could create a more kind of substantial thing to where people wouldn't feel like cuz cuz right now it feels like the people who are in these communities like there are a lot of people who are investing energy into different aspects of it but there's just no way in to to put it in uh a lot of different places and I I felt like you know I guess I've seen multiple sides of this cuz I've been like you know why why isn't anyone having a conversation about this game that I made. I think I think the thing that was more frustrating to me is that I just felt like when it came time for um you know, trying to submit to festivals and nominations, like I, I felt like kind of snubbed because I didn't present my work in a very particular way and it seemed kind of amateurish in some ways. Um you know, and I don't know. But but anyway, um like um I gonna say uh, like uh, it feels like it's it's all on you know a certain group of people to write about certain things or to make certain things like I um, I feel like as somebody who writes about who has written about games like I always feel like oh you know maybe I, I really need to be writing about all these smaller games I need to be doing this the problem is like it's nice to do it and I think it's it's important, but also like people don't really read those things and don't <laughs> really like respond outside of maybe the author and a few other people. Um, so like that's frustrating. But then and and then you get into a relationship wh where if you don't do it in the future for yeah for the author's other things, then it's frustrating. And then there, the other flip side is like, um, so so it's hard for like. There's there isn't a lot of incentive for critics or whatever to uh, write about things that aren't already popular or part of a conversation and kind of create their own conversations because oftentimes no one really 
you know, joins that conversation. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other side is like, you know, is what I experienced with that game where I was just like, you know, it, it, the, all the effort and stuff gets put on individual people who might already be, have a lot of things going on or a lot of, you know, time to that they need to commit to other things. And, you know, they don't necessarily – people might think that, like, me, for example, people might think that I have a big platform, but I don't. Like, most people – like, it's a small – it's a relatively small amount of people that pay attention to things that I do, but for somebody who isn't part of that community at all, like I might seem like really like I know all this stuff or, you know, like most people will give me the time of day, which is just not true. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and there are very few of those voices even out there. And even for those people out there, it's like, it, there's still kind of a limited subset of people who will pay attention and, you know, even for people who have a platform and are doing a lot of stuff, even when they, you know, might write about something like um, if they're writing about s a lot of different things and they're writing about things that are maybe more obscure, like it's going to it's going to be like less and less people are going to be like looking at those things. So it's uh, like it, it, it's part of just the general feeling like they're like everything on the internet and uh, things in society in general are oriented <laughs> towards things that are popular are kind of become more popular and things that are not popular don't go anywhere like I don't know anyway um, <laughs> that's like a broad discussion I guess I wanted to like shift gears a little bit you know so we, we could finish on maybe talking about some of your works and also what's kind of like a, f a few works just that, that you think are really interesting or good that you want people to know about. Um, so I guess first uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about sort of your works and, and maybe, you know, the kind of stuff that you've done and whatever you want to say about that. And then we can go from there. Uh, sure. Uh, so, I mean, I started, well, I got into playing IF when I was a kid in the 80s and I really wanted to make my own. And um, and I tried, you know, sort of making various things in basic, not very effectively. Um, and it wasn't until I was in college that I found out that this Usenet community existed and that there were tools for writing interactive fiction. And that at that point, that became kind of an obsessive hobby. Um, and... So the first piece that I wrote was a sort of conversational game called Galatea, where you're talking to um, a character who's a statue that's been brought to life, and there's kind of the question of, like, is that story true? Is it false? Like, what is she really talking about? Um, and there are a number of different ways that that story can end, um, but it was a traditional piece of parser interactive fiction, and um, I came into it because a lot of the text adventures that I was playing at the time had a very simplistic role for their non-player characters, which was that those characters um, typically would be part of a puzzle in some way, so either they would have some information that you needed to get out of them, or they would be blocking some area that you were trying to get into, you know, they would be a guard, they would be the source of a fetch quest, they'd, be, they'd have a very sort of game mechanical function, um, and you could ask them about keywords, but if you ask them about the same keyword 10 times, you would get the same answer back 10 times. Um, and there was no sense of like, you're actually developing a relationship with this character. Um, and there were a few pieces where people had tried to, to, to make those interactions a little bit more like sort of standard fiction. So um, games like Photopia, you actually had menus that controlled conversations that you were having with characters. Um, but I wanted to, to experiment with having something a bit more freeform where you could really kind of affect the emotional state that you had with this character. And so um, so the entire piece is just this one room game of, of con like conversation with her. Um, and after that, I wrote a, a number of other things, some of which are much more um, sort of conventional text adventure shaped things. So I wrote a game called Savoir Faire, which is basically trying to do a lot of classic puzzle, Infocom style stuff. I even mocked up some box art for it that looked sort of as though it were an Infocom piece. Um, 
but uh, but trying to to make some of those puzzles a little bit more modern and less annoying. So so basically, sort of take classic puzzle design um, and make it a little bit more forgiving, but still basically do that that thing. Um, and so uh, from there, sort of what I what I did as an IF author has really been all over the map. Um, but uh, I've kind of kept coming back to the interest in how do you model and represent dialogue? How do you make interactive characters who seem like they have some kind of emotional life, who have a memory of how you've interacted with them? How do you make a dynamic character who um, has some subjectivity and that you would need to interact with in a way that respects them as a person rather than just seeing them as a kind of gameplay obstacle. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's kind of animated a lot of my subsequent work. And I, I've i done some things since then um, that were based on sort of more extensive um, underlying AI. So I was on a project called the Versu Project for a couple of years, which was um, had all of the characters' models as agents who actually had desires to do different kinds of social actions. Um, and that was a case of um, developing that in a commercial context and then the commercial context going away, um, essentially. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so I mean, I, I sort of keep coming back to those questions of how do we make interactive pieces that are about relationships and about those interpersonal kinds of of experiences, and some of them are supported by um, by a lot of procedural and technical underpinnings, and some of them are just attempts to to do that side of things through writing and and give you sort of a more choice based experience. Um, so one of the other things that I did was a game called First Draft of the Revolution. Um, which maybe I shouldn't even call game. It's more on the the work or story end of the spectrum, really. Um, where uh, it's about the, the characters are writing letters to one another, um, hence the first draft part. Um, and on each page, you see sort of what they've written down to start with that they're not happy with, um, and you kind of help them revise until they get to a format of their letter that they're willing to send. And so all of the interaction is really about sort of seeing what are people hesitating to say to one another? What do they want to say that they feel they can't say? What are they rephrasing and why? Um, and, you know, it was kind of a way of getting into the social implications of the way we revise in the writing process. Um, so it was, a, it was a, I mean, that might seem like a very strange thing to explore in a game, but... Um, but I really liked writing and it. it was a kind of thing where I think it would have been hard to capture that kind of experience at all in a piece of static fiction. Um, I'm like I'm not sure how you would present that or if you tried to present that, I think it would feel very slow moving because you'd basically be like watching the characters change their minds. Whereas if you're actually involved in the mind changing, that a little, a little bit more sort of dynamic flow. Um, yeah. So yeah, kind of all over the map. So right now, I actually um, I work three quarter time for a company called Spirit AI, which is actually pursuing some of the uh, character dialogue AI development side of things. And I can't go into terribly deep detail on what we're doing there because it's all pretty NDA'd up still. <laughs> um, but it's cool stuff. Um, and then the rest of my time I'm doing freelance game writing and writing the odd occasional piece myself. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the... Um, I mean, I think that's the big difference between, well, something like... I mean, that's that's the reason why I'm, I'm so interested in a lot of, you know, what could be considered game-oriented or you know interactive software we'll say is just because there's that element of there's always an element of unpredictability there and like the idea that you could do something and you have no idea what's going to happen <laughs> um and i don't know that's the thing that kind of keeps me coming back to a lot of that stuff that it isn't just completely static you know um or e even if the experience is maybe ultimately fairly set like you just there's a degree of like I don't know 
just the the way that you interact and try and figure out the world it it kind of says something about the way that it's more active or whatever and the and the and your kind of shaping an experience in an in an active way is i guess what really appeals to me yeah i mean th- there are a couple of things there are a couple of different modes in which i think about this like sometimes i think of it as being kind of like um an improv scenario where as an author, I've put certain possibilities into the space, but it's partly about what the player decides to pick up on. Um, and so, you know, any individual run through is going to depend on kind of what they've brought to it as well as what I've brought to it. Um, and sometimes I think of it in terms of, you know, any given like any given moment in a piece of interactive fiction, whether that's like the paragraph before a choice in a choice-based work, or it's um, what happens after a turn in a parser-based work um, before the next command line. Like, all of those things, I am I want to set it up so that the player wants something back from the story, and then they they have an opportunity to try and get that thing. Um, whether that's, like, you know, to explore this world that I've built or to advance some interaction between the characters or whatever, but there's this kind of, like, ideally this kind of back and forth um, of them actively wanting something out of the story. Mhm. Well, and it seems like some of your work is maybe kind of like uh, well, like in in a lot of these in in games in general, like in parser games too, there like traditionally there's this kind of uh very um I don't know. I guess you call it like left-brained, more logic <laughs> sort of uh mindset in in the way that things are designed so reality is is basically an interface and it's a matter of just solving the interface in a way <laughs> that you know is like and and objects usually mean uh, similar kinds of things and and maybe maybe some of that struggle to to make a, a more kind of a, a substantial or 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 like human or reactive feeling sort of uh, thing that you you talk to is a way of of trying to make these things feel more human and more like realistic more like realistic to what someone actually experiences you know in everyday life yeah or at least that's the way i see it <laughs> well no the realism point is an interesting one i sometimes I, I don't mean like straight. I don't. I don't mean like the straight ideal of realism, but like uh, realistic in a way that's like, like ver- the the director Werner Herzog has this uh, line called or this phrase called ecstatic truth. And it's <laughs> basically you're like you're you're capturing. You may not be capturing like the the idea of the truth, like you know this this left brain photographic depiction, but you're capturing the essence of it. Some kind of deeper ideal of the truth rather than you know something specific that that's what i mean by realistic i guess yeah that you're capturing something that you've observed about either the world around you or your own kind of interior processes i guess yeah that's absurd yeah i mean one of the things that i find really exciting about sort of trends in in well, Twine specifically, I think this is not this is not like all choice games, but because like Twine does so much with text being replaced by other text, right? Like you click on something and you get something else in its place, and that is really effective at presenting sort of a shifting narrative viewpoint. Like the narrator tells you how they see the world, and then you kind of push on it and then they have a slightly different perception to offer you instead Um, and people, different authors have done really different things with that so some of the time it's like the narrator is a little bit unreliable and initially is lying to you a little bit or the narrator is like ambivalent about how they feel about something and you're kind of delving into that but I think that like that particular mechanic is really rich for capturing like certain types of cognitive dissonance and shifting perception um, in a way that like hadn't been demonstrated in, in interactive fiction nearly as much before it came along. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I guess um, I wanted to end on asking you um, what some of your favorite, or not even just favorite, but um, also some of the most interesting 
works that you think that you've you've played or you've read or <laughs> you know um <laughs> yeah yeah um i mean favorite lists are always incredibly hard but um to, to pick out some things recently that would be interesting for people to try um so not super super recent but over the past few years like one of the biggest pieces of parser if and like i think some people would say sort of it's apotheosis um is a game called hadian lands um, by andrew platkin which is um it's a huge piece of work that he got kick-started um and then spent years developing and the premise is that you are stranded in this spaceship that runs on alchemy um, and so you have to run around and collect alchemical ingredients and use those to fix things around the ship. Um, and from time to time, you can uh, sort of reset the whole world and everything goes back to where it used to be, except that when you do that, you retain all of the knowledge that you gained in the previous one. So if you've learned a spell um, or, or an alchemical ritual, actually, I should say, um, you retain that knowledge... Um, but all of the ingredients that you use to get there and go back to where they used to be. Um, and it's this incredibly intricate puzzle game where you're trying to work out what combinations of ingredients you can use in which rituals simultaneously in order to get to certain outcomes before you reset the whole thing over and over again. Um, and it's really intricately programmed as well. So one of the other things is once you've done a ritual um, it remembers how you did that and then in the future you can just do that same ritual over again by telling it to 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 create that object um and it's really so it, it's it's stored all of that information and the result is like at the beginning of the gameplay you spend all your time wandering around and finding these you know fairly basic objects and doing um rituals in a very uh, like it's sort of in a very beginner way and by the end of the game you are accomplishing these incredibly complicated tasks because it basically has made macros for you it's made it so that you can do a hundred turns worth of work in a single command because it's remembered how you taught it to do that um, so it's it's like technically probably the most virtuosic piece of, of parser based IF out there um, but it also sort of does this really interesting thing from a story perspective of sort of capturing that arc of competence. And, you know, there, there are so many games where you are leveling up, but what leveling up means is just that things get easier for you. Um, and here, leveling up, like, it, you're actually changing kind of the complexity level of what you're doing. And it's, it's just, it's kind of a fascinating experience. Um, so for people who are interested in that kind of thing, it's not it's not an easy piece of work, but it's a really really impressive one. Um, oh, and that's is it a is it more pars is it parser based? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. What's what's the name of the game again? Sorry, I, Hades and Lands. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Keep going. Are there, are there other ones? <laughs> yes, there are other ones. Sorry, like I tend to give long blurbs. Oh, yes, but <laughs> oh no no, it's that's actually very very useful. Um, so on the comp on a completely different end of the spectrum, like a very different type of game in every respect, um, is a Birdland, um, which came out last year. Um, Brendan Patrick Hennessy, and it is a game about um, <laughs> basically like being a teenage lesbian at summer camp um, and figuring out what is going on with your life and also having surreal dreams about um, birds that are actually space aliens. Um, and <laughs> as weird as that, like that, that may sound like, like not a very, I mean, it's the thing, it sounds like a really wacky premise, but actually it's quite a cohesive piece of fiction. Um, and it's just wonderfully characterized. Like there are, and really funny, like I sort of laugh out loud, dialogue um so that's a twine piece it's a lot more um you know if you like if you want something that you can definitely play and get through i don't know that there's even a way to lose it i don't think you can do something so wrong that you lose birdland um but uh but what it does with its interactivity instead is make that interactivity be about sort of deciding what kind of person you want to present yourself as from day to day because the protagonist is really 
I mean, it's just sort of trying on different identities. And, um, you know, do you, do you want to sort of emphasize being melancholy and a little bit gothy? Or do you want to, you know, like, come off as kind of super perky? Like, what is the personality that you want to perform from day to day? Um, and the interaction is a lot about that and how that affects your relationships with the other characters. Cool. I might, yeah, I might, I might check that out. That seems, that seems like something that would personally <laughs> appeal to me a lot. It's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, he's actually done a couple of, of follow-up pieces to that as well. So, like, if you get really into it, like, there's, there's more out there. Um, and there's a ton of Birdland fa- fan art also, which is kind of sweet. I think I've uh, played or read something of his before, like an interactive fiction thing. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It wasn't it wasn't his first work, so yeah. Um, yeah, and then um, I just there's there's a ton of other stuff you know out there. Um, I really like uh, Chandler Groover's work. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him at all. Um, he's no, I haven't. Kind of, short horror pieces um so and he they're kind of evenly mixed actually he's done some that are sort of straight parser he's done some that are limited parser um and then he's done some twine pieces um but he's got a really good sort of sense of how to get a creepy (laughs) creepy vibe going um in a relatively short amount of space um and gosh like i Porpentine is amazing, um, has done a lot of really impressive, intense things. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, (laughs) there are many possible directions to take this. Um, Is there, is there something that um, has stood out to you as maybe you didn't like, maybe it's like not your, your favorite favorite, but you think is like really kind of just new and interesting, just something really different well there's a lot of <sighs> hmm. I mean so I mentioned earlier I mean this is this is different in a in a structural way rather than different in a in a content way um, but uh, the game that actually won IFCOMP this year um, that has that sort of hybrid choice interface is called Detective Land and that's probably worth checking out for people um, okay if I were going to pick something that's really, really unusual, um, there was a game released e- earlier this year, and it's got a complicated title, so I'm going to quickly look it up so that I don't uh, <laughs> miss uh, name it on the show. Right, okay, so it's called Harmonic Time Bind Ritual Symphony um, nice. by that's Ben Kidwell and Mabel Straw. Mabel, I'm not even sure how this person's name is supposed to be pronounced, I'm afraid, so if I've done it horribly wrong, I apologize. Um, but it is a story about being like experiencing this really sort of overwhelming manic episode, and the protagonist goes around like believing that he's receiving these instructions about like the the cosmic wheel and like messages from the moon and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's actually based on this like Ben Kidwell's actual experience with this like he actually was in this mental state for a time um and so it's a game that's kind of reproducing what that was like and it makes for really interesting gameplay because it like it gives this fictional framework for why you have this impetus to do very unusual things like you keep thinking like oh the 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 universe wants me to to do this thing where I go and tell the barista at my local um, coffee shop about, like, the powers of the moon or whatever. And so, like, it's sort of simultaneously very strange and artificial, but also kind of translating that psychological experience into gameplay fairly effectively, I thought. Um, And it's a really... I mean, despite... Like, it might sound like it's sort of describing something unpleasant but it's actually very like it's it's internal perspective is actually really positive like it's sort of like we're bringing about this positive change in the universe and like we feel connected to all of these different characters and it, it's like it's it's actually quite upbeat um so yeah but it's it's like just basically different from pretty much anything else i've ever played so um 
yeah, unusual. Cool. Cool. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to talk about relevant to interactive fiction or anything else be- before we we conclude this <laughs> podcast? I think I've rambled extensively at this point. I mean, there's there's a long list of other IF I could, like, mention, but, I yeah, I always feel self-conscious about what I mention and what I leave out. So, it's, um, Is there, like, a, a, a centralized website that, that people should go to to, to check IF or... Uh, yeah, so there, there are kind of a, two places that you could um, keep an eye on things. So if you're looking for new I have to play, um, ifdb.tads, so that's T-A-D-S dot org, um, is the IF database. Um, and that's useful because it lists all, you know, when, when people put new things out, they tend to um, create pages for them. So you can see what's been released recently. And then it also has, like, reviews and recommendation lists and stuff on it. Um, so if you're looking for a particular type of IF, you often can do a search on IFDB and find it. Um, so that's useful. Um, and then if you're more interested in sort of tracking what people are saying about IF, then um, there's a blog aggregator called planet-if.com. Um, and that just pulls together a bunch of different blogs by different people. I mean, my blog, but also lots of other blogs where people write reviews and um, development logs and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Um, and you you have a blog too, right? Yes. Like you you up you update it fairly frequently. <laughs> uh, w- yeah. What's, what's the address of your blog again? Uh, so it's mshort.wordpress.com. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll put I'll put a link to that and um, maybe a link to, uh, you know, a few other a few other things relevant to this conversation <laughs> just in cool. the in the description. And this should be on, I. Yeah, this hopefully this will be on iTunes as well as I I I've been putting this on archive.org because I feel like it's relevant to some of the conversations <laughs> about preservation yeah. and, and stuff like that. Um and I also put it on YouTube in case anyone wants to listen to it there. So it should be on all those places, hopefully on iTunes. Somebody else set that up. But anyway, uh I've been talking to Emily Short. Um thank you Emily for talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, happy to. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And um, I will definitely check out some of those works um, and definitely recommend other people do as well. Cool. Well, uh, I will see everyone. See you later. (laughs) 